the most repeated question by Jesus during his ministry was this, have you never read? Have you never read? Underneath that simple question is a life altering implication. You should read the word of God. That's why Jesus also says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knows that there is a spiritual hunger inside of every human heart that can only be satisfied by consuming the words of God. Christian, give yourself to the word of God. The word of God is a rock, strong and steady. It doesn't budge, break, or crumble under pressure. It's an anchor in the storm, keeping us calm when everything around us is chaotic. The Word of God is a mirror showing us who we really are. You don't just read the Word of God, it reads you. It's a treasure, beautiful in every dimension and worth every effort of discovery. It brings endless joy and eternal riches to all who find it. It's a fire spreading across the world to bring heat and light. It's a river bringing life and power to everything it touches. The Word of God is a seed planted deep inside of our hearts, producing the fruit of holiness and righteousness. The Word of God is a sword dividing true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. It's a hammer crushing what needs to be crushed and breaking what needs to be broken. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to show us our path. So let the voice of God be the first, the last, and the loudest voice in your ear today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Give yourself to the Word of God. It was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeshua is the Word, and His voice rings down through the centuries because the prophets wrote His voice down. And in the 1,189 chapters of the book in your lap, His voice still rings out. The same voice that called out in the beginning, let there be light, is the same voice that said, I will reveal to you what the end will be. So his voice said to John, write down what you have seen, the things that are and the things that are to come. And he wrote it down in a book we call Revelation, but it make no mistake, it is the voice of, of the one and only true God who cannot lie and cannot fail, who has existed since before time and will exist beyond it. He is the beginning. He is the end. He knows the end. So as we go through the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, we are literally seeing future history laid out for us like a map. But not only are we seeing future history, we are also seeing the principles of what it means to relate to God, principles that we can and should apply in our lives here, now, today, every day. And one of those principles right off the bat is that we need to be a people of the Word. You need to be reading God's Word, listening to God's Word, memorizing God's Word because Jesus said, my sheep know me, they hear my voice, and they follow me. You need to know him so that you can hear his voice and then follow him. And the only way to do that is to be in his word. Better than 80% of professing Christians have never read the Bible from cover to cover. And how many of you learned when we were doing Exodus that even... The weird stuff about sacrifices, you can learn a lot. How many of you found stuff in there you just, didn't even, you just didn't even know it was there? Every word in God's word is his voice, and it is important. And Revelation 
is telling us, here's how God is going to fulfill the promises he made to Avraham many, many years ago when he called him out of the land of Ur and his son Tzach and his grandson Jacob. He said, I am going to make your people like the, like the stars. You won't even be able to count them. And this land, I'm going to give it all to you. And he made promises. We call it the Abrahamic or Avrahamic covenant. He made promises to his servant David, David. He made promises that have yet to be fulfilled. So when Yeshua was here, he, he offered the kingdom to the Jewish nation, but they rejected him. And because they rejected him, he said, fine, I'm going to leave for a little while. And in that meantime, the Holy Spirit is going to come and is going to draw people out for me from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. That would be you, the non-Jewish Gentile people that he has called. But we are grafted in, and you see Israel, the people, the Jewish people, those promises still need to be fulfilled, and that's what Revelation is all about. Too many people think Revelation is about American Christians. How many of you know that? It's not true. It's about fulfilling the promises he made to the Jewish people. And he said that this church age, this time of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. It's not going to last forever. And at some point, we know from Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that there's probably going to be seven distinct time periods within that church age. And all seven of them have taken place. At some point, we knew that this was going to come to an end point. The church age would end. And there was all kinds of little clues that we talked about. The founding of the nation of Israel again, which happened in 1948. Uh, the Jewish people taking control of the city of Jerusalem, that happened in 1967. We know that Jesus said, when you see these things, the generation that sees those things won't pass away before they see the coming of the Son of Man. We are in the last days, the very end. And at some point, we don't know when, say it with me, the rapture can happen at any time. He is going to sound the trumpet, and you and I are going to literally jump into our resurrection bodies. It's going to be good. And in that moment, it will open up a time period of the judgments of God. Now, we don't know if there's a gap between the rapture and when the final seven-year time period begins. There might be. But one way or another, during that seven-year time period, 144,000 Jewish believers will be out preaching the gospel Two witnesses in Jerusalem who call down fire from heaven and do all kinds of things. The witness of God will be very strong. Many people will be, will be saved. And many people will reject Him. And it will be war. But at the end of that seven-year time period, Yeshua is going to physically return to this planet and you and I will be with Him. You and I will be with Him. Now, the fun part about that, well, there's a lot of fun parts about that, but <clears throat> the truth is, as John is seeing this, he's seeing this uh, with all of these incredible vivid images, right? And he's seeing it in such a way that it's like an explosion. Like we talked about last week, it's like an explosion of hallelujahs. It was an overwhelming emotional experience. And as we read Revelation 19, verses 1 through 9, we got to the end and it said, these are the very words of, the, of God. I mean, you're just all fired up. And then look at verse 10. Then I, John, fell at his feet, the angel, to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I, I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brothers and your sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For, that word for in Greek means because, because the testimony of Jesus 
is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, everything that you're seeing here, this whole prophecy, it's all about Yeshua. Now, people get fixated on John making this big mistake, right? I mean, and I've, I've heard sermons on it, but I think some of these things really miss the point here because you got you to gotta recognize the context of where John is and what he's been seeing. He's standing next to this shockingly beautiful angel. This, this, this angel has been in the presence of, of God. I mean, uh, the, the beauty of this must have been beyond belief. And all of these hallelujahs, I mean, this was an absolute rock concert. I mean, he was just, I mean, how many of you know that if you're in the middle of that, it is very difficult to go, yeah, whatever. No, there's a lot of energy in that. And, and, and he's seeing all of this hallelujah and everybody's fired up and Jesus is coming back. I mean, it was just emotionally overwhelming. Emotionally overwhelming. And that, remember I told you that the Lord just never lets me preach a sermon that I don't get to live it first. I don't know why he does that to me. <laughs> it's really annoying. But the truth is, the point that I could make to you, and I, and, I, and I plead with you to hear this. You have emotions because you are made in the image of God. But the difference is, God has emotions, but those emotions never overcome his will. You and I, our emotions overcome our will Every day. And one of the things about following Jesus, when Jesus said, following me is like, take up your cross, like a cross, it's hard to bear, is your emotions tell you one thing, Jesus' voice tells you something else. Your emotions say, I want, I desire, I'm angry, I need, and it pulls you this way. Your emotions are real, they're powerful, they can be overwhelming. But his voice says, do this. And sometimes that's, that's like a cross to bear. So I think that when people get fixated on John's mistake, they forget something. They forget. They forget that John had more seminary training than any doctoral candidate has ever even dreamed of. John has more, had more training in theology and doctrine and apologetics than anybody in the history of the human race because he was there. He sat around the same campfire and ate the same s'mores as Jesus for three years. Not only that, John was the only one of the disciples standing at the cross. He watched him die. And he was there when he rose again. The best apologetics in history. Talk about writing a book. And he did. A book you and I still read. He had more training, more background than any of us. And yet, he made this mistake. Turning around to fall down and worship an angel. Why? Because it proves, listen, your emotions can compromise you. If they can compromise John, they can compromise you and I. We have got to be the kind of people that recognize when emotional intensity comes our way, we make sure we are listening to the voice of God. And I assure you, I assure you that the emotions are coming stronger and stronger and stronger because the persecution is coming down upon our people. I mean, just, just talking about what was happening to people I know in Canada, the emotions were so intense in me, I had to really restrain. It didn't do so good last night on that issue. I, had to, I shouted at my own people. It was really, I'm sorry. And that's the point. It doesn't matter how much training you have. Emotions can compromise you. Now, of course, you're listening to that and go, well, duh, I knew that already. I didn't have to come to church to hear that. Yeah, well, if you know it, why don't you live it? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think maybe I should be reminded of it. Yeah, we all need a good reminder. Because even John could fail. 
And what it reminds us of is that no matter how beautiful or amazing or emotionally intense an experience is, your first obligation is to listen to the voice of the living God that comes out of his word to tell you what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is bad. Because there's plenty of emotional things going on within quote-unquote Christian churches right now. There are things out there that I have seen on the internet that are supposedly Christian, but they're just emotional hype because they contradict what God's Word says. So we need the same warning. If, 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 if even John, who sat at Jesus' feet for years, can be overcome emotionally to make that kind of a mistake, so can you. You must be sold out to being in the Word. You must be constantly looking at the teaching. My teaching, the teaching in in your Bible studies, the teaching you listen to online, does it line up with the voice of the Word of God? If it doesn't, it's false, rejected. I don't care what the emotions are. I don't care how pretty it sounds. I don't care how nice it sounds. It doesn't matter because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of who? Yeshua, not your emotions, not a pastor, not a speaker, not a denomination, his voice alone. But you know, there's, there's two other principles we can pull out of this while we're talking about this. Now, these are principles that I'm pulling out of God's word. I'm just looking at what John did and how that was emotionally a compromise. And I'm thinking, you know, there's some other things that we could grab out of this. For one... You need to recognize that sometimes God will use a leader in a powerful way. Sometimes God will bless a leader with with skills or talents that are above the ordinary. And oftentimes people can get more fixated on the leader than on God who's using the leader. Dangerous. And, And that can happen Uh, not just with spiritual leaders like in the church, like pastors. That can happen in a family. Where all of a sudden you have one family member because maybe they have greater skills than everybody else. Maybe they, they are prettier than everybody else. I don't know. Maybe they cook better at Thanksgiving. Something makes everybody think that, well, we have to do it his way or her way Because they are more skilled, they are more talented, they are prettier, whatever it happens to be. But you need to go, I don't care if it's mom, dad, grandpa, Uncle Fred. I don't care if it's a pastor. I don't care if it's, it's, uh, you know, a Bible study. I don't care who it is. I don't care what kind of skills and talents they have. If what they are saying contradicts God's word, I listen to the voice of my king first. Somebody say, amen. You need to do this. The Bereans checked out everything that Paul said, and Paul commended them for it. In the same way, everything I'm telling you, you'd better check it out yourself. I do my best. I don't want to teach you falsely because I know that the Lord is holding me to a much higher standard. Believe me, that makes my knees knock. I got to answer to the living God for what I tell you. Scary. But there's a second principle. Now, I think that what's happening here is an honest mistake because it's an emotional thing. He's just simply overwhelmed. And sometimes that happens to you and I too. I mean, there there will come a point in your life where you're going to run into a crisis, where you're going to need help, when you're going to need guidance, when you're going to need input, you're going to need counseling, and you're going to come to a leader, pastor, pastor, you know, a Bible study leader, whatever. And that leader is going to provide for you the uh, emotional support, the spiritual support that you need in that moment. The problem is, if you get too fixated on the person that helped you instead of the God who used the person to help you, what's going to happen when the person lets you down? No, when the person lets you down. Because I guarantee you, we all will whether it's a spouse or a brother or a sister or a mom or a dad, we're just peoples. And it's important to recognize that. 
and hold on to that because sometimes we put expectations on people that should only be put on Yeshua. We put expectations on a leader and forget that leaders can have bad days. We forget that leaders can be people just like us. It happens. Years and years ago when I was, uh, uh, I don't know, I must have been 12 or 13 years old, we had a uh, special um, uh, guy come to the church. And I remember distinctly walking down the hallway and seeing him. He was a celebrity. He was well-known. And when I said, hi, he walked right past me as if I was part of the wall. And it really seriously hurt my feelings. And I thought, well, you just didn't know I'm a kid. No, you know, I just one of those kind of things. Fast forward to about a year later. Same guy was at the church. Same celebrity. Same hallway. And I'm, I'm walking down the hallway, and here he comes, and I, I decided to try it again. And this time when I said hello, he stopped, looked right at me, and went, well, hi, how are you? And shook my hand. And I, I was completely opposite to what happened the year before. And I went, what, did I get older? Or am I, I you know, smell better this time? I, I mean, what was going on? And I said to something to him about it. I said, you know, a year ago, uh, I was walking down this same hallway, and I said hello to you, and you, 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 walked, you ignored me like I, I wasn't even there. And he goes, oh, I am so sorry. You know, he said sometimes, because he was a musician, he said sometimes I, I just get so focused on what I got to do. I mean, there's 3,000 people out there, and, and, and I'm, I've got to perform in front of them in, what, five minutes? He said, I'm so sorry, young man. I, I just was so focused, I didn't think about it. You know, that story has stuck with me all these years because it's reminded me of something. No matter how many skills, talents, abilities, no matter how much the Holy Spirit is using you, you're still a people. And people have bad days. And it's important for you to recognize this. Don't put expectations on me, on Melissa, on Doug, on Carrie, on Greg, on uh, whatever the leaders are here at this church. Don't put expectations on them that should only be put on Yeshua. We all have bad days. We do our best, but we're not Jesus. We just work for Him. And it's important to recognize that because sometimes people get seriously disillusioned about Jesus Himself because of the behavior of a leader. They somehow equate what a guy up here is well, he, he represents Jesus. Therefore, if he falls, Jesus must be bad. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You have, you have a pastor that has some kind of a moral failure and, and, and it falls and it's all over the news and it's everywhere and it's horrible. And you have people that will literally say, well, I'm done with being a Christian. Well, then you never were a Christian in the first place because you're putting your eyes on a person. Now, look, I'm not trying to make excuses for moral failure. It's, it's true. Our leadership in Christianity is held to a higher standard. But it is a higher standard, which means, guys, we can afford a whole lot of grace, couldn't we? Because we're held to a higher standard. It is hard. And we don't always get it. And, and I have literally had, Melissa remembers this as soon as I say this, she's going to smile. She knows what I'm saying. We had this family one time. They called us and said, we have to talk to you right now. And we went down to Starbucks, and they sat and proceeded to tell us why they were leaving the church because we didn't greet them in the hallway at church. Remember that? I mean, and, and they, were up, they were not a little upset. They were a lot upset. We were here back when we were, you know, pulling the stuff out, in and out of the trailer. And, and just because the church is getting bigger, and, and, and now you're ignoring us when you go down the hallway... No, it's kind of like that celebrity pastor that I ran into when I was a kid. One time he saw me, one time he didn't. Why? Because he's just a people. And as this church gets bigger, I am not going to be able to go to lunch with every single person. 
There are more than 600 people coming to this church now. If I went to lunch with every one of you, it would take several years to get to you. It's, it, just be realistic about this. I plead with you on that because there's a lot of pressure. I'm not, I'm not just talking about me. I have a pastoral staff for a reason because I can't handle all of it, can I? That's why I got Doug and Carrie. That's why I've got Greg and, and, and Courtney. And it's why I got Paul and Bonnie. You know, I, I have it's, it's Steve Alkire and Steve Long and Sherry Long. I have these people on this staff because Melissa and I can't do everything, but even they, I mean, still add it up. That's what are eight, eight or nine people on my executive staff? How many of them can meet with everybody? They can't. How many of them are going to greet everybody in the hallway? They can't. We need grace too. Don't put expectations on us that should only be on Yeshua. And that I think, listen, that I think is why the angel doesn't get mad at John. He doesn't get mad at John. He simply explains it. Keep your eyes on Jesus, John. You don't worship me. You worship God. It's all about him. Keep your eyes on him. He recognized that was an emotional mistake. And in the same way, I recognize that some of you get irritated or bitter because the church gets bigger and now you can't get my ear. I get it. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Not on me. Not on Melissa. Not on any of this staff. On him. It's all about him. And that brings up another thing. Every Bible study, every Bible study leader, every spiritual gift given to anybody should all be about Jesus, not that person, not that church, not that denomination. It's all about Yeshua, period. And if it's not, change churches fast because it needs to be about Yeshua, so that's why the angel doesn't get mad at him. He said, look, I know you're an emotional creature. You were overwhelmed. I get it. But just uh, stop that. Keep your eyes on Yeshua. That's what you got to do. Because that's what the whole Bible is about. It's about him. Let's go on from there. Verse 11. It says, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And somebody say, Hallelujah. This is your King coming in in victory. Now remember, there's always a pattern in the book of Revelation, isn't there? We always see something that's visionary or symbolic, and it's linked to something literal. It's not all one or the other. Now, you got to see this in its context. I saw heaven opened means I'm seeing a heavenly vision. Does Jesus really have a sword physically in his mouth? No, this is a vision that's telling you something. Symbolically, a sword cuts. It destroys. It kills and he's saying his word, his very voice can cut everybody down. That's, it's symbolic. So since it's a vision, what's physical? The physical is the return of Jesus. We know this because we read back in Matthew uh, chapter 24. We also read in, in, in all four of the Gospels how the, the angels said that when Jesus ascended, you see him ascending like this, someday he's coming back the same way. It's physical. What's physical is the return of Jesus. Now, the symbolism here, let's take a look at some of these symbols. The horse, the white horse. White horses in uh, ancient times were always symbolic of victory because the, the, the Caesars would come into Rome uh, after a, a battle that they had won, 
riding on a white horse. So this is a symbol of victory. The flames, whenever you see flames used in Scripture, symbolically, they are either judgment or purification, and sometimes both. And in this case, you see eyes of fire, so you know that this is symbolic, that Jesus sees clearly to judge, sees clearly to purify. That's what he's seeing, the crowns. We talked about crowns last week. The crowns, these particular crowns, this is a different word here in Greek, uh, last week we talked about the crown Stephanos, which are victory crowns. This is a different one. This is Diamat, which is um, uh, crowns of royalty, crowns of authority and reward. So when he returns, he's returning with all authority. God has given him all authority. And his reward is absolute victory. His judgment is 100% certain. That's what we are seeing. And the, the name, twice it mentions name. And whenever God repeats himself, it's important. The first name is a name that only he himself knows. Because you see, in the Bible, names represented the true essence of of a thing or a person, which is why God would change the names of some of his servants. Do you remember this? Okay, Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, sometimes deceiver or even liar. But in his growth, Jacob grew up, and God said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, it will be Yisrael which means he who wrestles with God. It changes his character, his essence. Avram became Avraham, father of many nations. God changed his name because his essence, his character changed. And the Bible says that the day is coming. Listen, we read it in an earlier chapter of Revelation. The day is coming when he will give you, 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 all of you, his servants. He will give you a white stone. And on that stone is a name that only you and he will know. It's your real name. And when he gives it to me, I'm going to go, oh, put that in my pocket. That's mine. That's between me and him. A name that only I will know. Special and intimate and beautiful. But then he has a name that everybody knows, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Names. But you know, just as we see that these names have meaning, it reminds us that Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of of God's promises to the Jewish people. So when it says that his robe is dipped in blood, people, I've looked through the commentaries and there was exactly two that went, wait a minute, this is actually a reference to the Old Testament. It's actually a reference to Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 6, where the Messiah is described riding in victory into Jerusalem. Now to give you what's going on here, you, you've got to recognize that at the end of the seven-year time period, we, we just saw that the, 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 uh, s- the religious system that the Antichrist is going to use is torn down, right? Then we saw that his capital city, his economic system is destroyed. You remember that? Now, Jesus is about to return, and the final seven vials of his wrath are being poured out just as he comes back. But in that moment... The Antichrist will know he has lost the battle. He knows he's lost, so he's going to lie to everybody. The Bible even talks about it in uh, Revelation here where it says it's like frogs coming out of his mouth. You remember that? I mean, he's going to pour out these lies on his followers who have the mark of loyalty to him, and he's going to say, this is it. We have to go down and destroy the people of God, and he will attack in two places. He's going to come from the north into Jerusalem, and he's going to have a second arm that's going to come south up through Bozra, which is what we call Petra now. These two arms of his army are coming in to try to destroy the people of God. They are literally going to break through into Jerusalem itself, taking over more than half the city just as Jesus returns. But listen, listen carefully. Jesus said, 
to the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish people at the time, when they rejected him as Messiah, he said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what did he mean? He meant that you as the Jewish nation have rejected me as your Messiah, and until you all say, Jesus is Messiah, you're not going to see me again. And that is coming. Right now, the Jewish people have been regathered into Israel, but they're regathered in unbelief. There are less than 20,000 Christian Jewish people in Israel today. Not very many. But the Bible tells us that after the rapture, these 144,000 are going to recognize Jesus as a Messiah, and they're going to begin to preach. But during that seven-year time period, how many of you know the Jewish people are going to continue to be stubborn all the way to the very end? But when they're down there in Bozrah, when they're, when they're hiding out in Petra, and some of them are still in Jerusalem, and now the Antichrist is coming, he's attacking, they are going to finally realize, wait a minute, this is the fulfillment of everything that that preacher said at Calvary Chapel 14.6. I saw it online. <laughs> they're gonna, something like that. I won't be here. I won't know. Here's the thing. They're going to recognize Yeshua he is our Messiah, and they will call upon him, save us! And in that moment, Jesus will say, I'm now, that's it, now I'm coming back. Look, Isaiah says, this is how he's going to come back. Why is your apparel red, and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And Messiah responds, I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no one with me. I also trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath. And their life blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my clothes. So when Yeshua returns, he will simply speak like a sword out of his mouth. You and I will be on horses and armies and we're going to have swords and it's all going to be just for show because we're not going to have to do nothing. We're going to be behind the king on his horse. All he's going to have to do is speak and all of his enemies will be obliterated in a moment, in a, just a flash, like a, just you know, imagine a cloud of red blood, just boom. That's what Jesus is going to do. And you and I are going to go, boy, I'm glad I'm on the right side of this horse. You know what I'm saying? Because we're just going to be there to witness. We're not going to have to draw a sword or do anything. It's going to be all him. He has treaded all alone. No one was with me. He did it by himself. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help. See, if you belong to him today, you'll be with him in that great day. Verse 17 it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great feast of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, or the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, both free and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So they're, they're beginning to attack. Yeshua is coming in. You and I are behind him. And it says this angel was standing in the sun. And people, you know, the critics, they just go crazy on this. Well, if he was standing in the sun, you know, 93 million miles away, it's a big ball guy. Well, that's stupid. You know, how many of you know an angel could stand on the surface of the sun if he wants to? How many of you know that? But I don't think that's what this means. I think this is really simple. If you, Dad, if you were looking up at the sun... And I'm now in the sun because I'm in the way. That's all there is to this. Don't read anything into it. It's simply an angel up in the heaven that just gets in the way of the sun. It's just, it's just that's all there is to it. But remember the pattern. We see something symbolic. We see something visionary, and it links to something literal. So seeing that angel, that's what's symbolic. So maybe he was standing on the sun for all I know. It doesn't matter. The symbolism is he's calling for these creatures. He's saying that this awful judgment against God's enemies is going to be so horrific that every vulture on this planet is going to want to come to the feast. Ugh. And he's trying to get you to understand the true grodiness of what's about to happen. Everybody say grody. We need to revive this word. It's an 80s word. 
It's a good word. It needs to be revived. You need to use it more often. We don't want to lose it with time here because the judgments of God have fallen for seven years. The Antichrist capital city has been destroyed. The Babylonian religion has fallen. The Antichrist is making his last stand. He's attacking Jerusalem. In fact, it's going to be door to door. Look at Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2. It's going to get so bad. It says, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be taken. The houses plundered, the women raped, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be eliminated from the city. Why? Because the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. The Lord will come back and in that moment, his long suffering against the free will of man will end. Now here's what I mean. From the day that Adam and Eve sinned till this moment, God has been long-suffering against the cruelty, the evil, the self-centeredness, the greed of human beings because in order to allow true free will, it has to be truly free. In order for there to be real love between God and human beings, they must be truly free, which means they must be really free to reject Him. And all we have to do is look at the history of the human race, and we can see the rejection of human beings is very real. And God has been long-suffering with it all the way up till this moment. But He is done! He is done with the hatred and the bigotry and the persecution and the cruelty of men. And he will pour out his indignation on that great day and you and I will be there to witness it. Verse 20. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Those who have hated God those who have rejected him, those who have persecuted his people, those who have exploited the poor and crushed the needy in order to engorge themselves with luxury, the Lord God is done. He has done everything he can to reach the human race. Everything. Gone all the way to the cross to pay for our sins. Sent prophets that the people killed sent pastors who were persecuted, sent good Christians into the deepest, darkest jungles of all the earth. He has spread his message to the ends of the earth. He has done all that he can. And those who have rejected him, they deserve the wrath of God at this time. And it will come. And it will come with a single word. Listen, the voice of of God, the same voice that said, let the stars appear, and he literally ignited the fires and the stars by his voice. That same voice will say, enough! And his enemies will literally explode. And here this Antichrist who had troubled the world for seven years and done all of these miracles and conquered the whole earth, literally evaporated. And he just simply grabs him. Antichrist, false prophet, come here, you turkeys, and into the lake of fire. That's it. I'm done. And you and I will be just sitting back going, we didn't even have to draw a sword, man. I mean, we didn't have to do nothing. I didn't even break a sweat. I mean, what kind of a battle is this? And we'll just worship him. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's going to be good. The voice of the king, the same voice that drew Adam up from the dust, And breathe life into him so that you and I would live today. The same voice, the same voice that said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come here, come out. The same voice that said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe, cling to, devote to him would have eternal 
Same voice. And if you put your trust in his voice, he cannot fail you. He cannot fail you. And that's the key. The same voice of God that will someday destroy his enemies is the voice of God that can and will give you life today. So give yourself to the word of God and live. Let's pray. Father God, we call upon you in Yeshua's name. For it is written, my sheep know me, they hear my voice, and they follow me. Lord, we talked about the power of the sword of your mouth. How you will destroy your enemies with a word. But Lord God, we pray this morning that your voice will ring through those of us who pray for others. That you, Holy Spirit, would pour out on the needy this morning. And if you're listening to my voice and your head is bowed and your eyes are shut and we don't want people looking around right now because this is a time of reflection. If you hear His voice and it's calling you to make a commitment to Him that you've never made before, you've been on the fence about this whole Christian thing and you hear all this stuff about Yeshua returning and you're afraid you're going to be on the wrong side of the horse. His voice is calling you. His voice is calling you. He's saying to you, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And if you have not responded to His voice yet, then you need to come up to this front and talk to these people here. They will pray with you. They will show you how to make that commitment. I don't have the gift of evangelism. All I can do is point you at Jesus. But if you need to make that commitment to Him, you come up here, but there's more. If you, as a Christian this morning, you've already made your commitment to Christ. But maybe you've been walking around feeling let down because one of the spiritual leaders in this house didn't greet you, didn't follow through. Somebody let you down, and you're fighting off bitterness and irritation. You know, this week I had to counsel somebody, hey, if that pastor hurts your feelings, why are you telling me? You need to go to them. That's Matthew 18. Yeah, 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 I know, but it's hard. Yes, I know it's hard. It's emotional. Remember, John? Emotions can compromise you sometimes. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do it His way. So if you've got a bitterness problem against a family member, against a spiritual leader, you need to come to the front and let these people lay hands on you so that the Holy Spirit can give you the strength and the power you need to go and make that right. Listen to the voice of the king. Maybe the voice of the king is saying to you today, there's something that has absolutely nothing to do with this sermon at all, and you need to come to the front and get on your face, on your knees before him. Then you need to listen to his voice because it is written, my sheep know me. They hear my voice and they follow Make sure that if God is calling you to apply what you heard today, that you don't leave this place the same way you came in. Father God, I pray you do business with your people, and we pray these things in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.